biggest question that Jared Diamond is asking himself is how to turn the study of history into a science. He notes the distinction between the hard sciences, such as physics, biology, and astronomy, and what we sometimes call the social sciences, which includes history, economics, government. The social sciences are often thought of as a pejorative. In particular, many of the so-called hard scientists, such as physicists or biologists, don't consider history to be a science. The situation is even more extreme because, he points out, even historians themselves don't consider history to be a science. Historians don't get training in the scientific methods. They don't get training in statistics. They don't get training in the experimental method of problems of doing experiments on historical subjects, and they'll often say that history is not a science, history is closer to an art. Jared comes to this question as one who is accomplished in two scientific areas, physiology and evolutionary biology. The first is a laboratory science, the second is never far from history. Biology is the science, he says. Evolution is the concept that makes biology unique. In his new theories of human development, he brings together history and biology in presenting a global account of the rise of civilization. In so doing he takes on race-based theories of human development. Most people are explicitly racists, he says. In parts of the world, so-called educated, so-called Western society, we've learned that it is not polite to be racist. And so often we don't express racist views, but nevertheless I've given lectures on this subject, and members of the National Academy of Sciences come up to me afterwards and say, but native Australians, they're so primitive. Racism is one of the big issues in the world today. Racism is the big social problem in the United States, so why are people racists? According to Jared, racism involves the belief that other people are not capable of being educated, or being human, that they're different from us, and they're less than human. It was through his work in New Guinea for the last 30 years that convinced him that it's not true. They are smarter than we are, he says. But perhaps the main reason why people resort to racist explanations, he notes, is that they don't have another answer. Until there's a convincing answer why history really took the course that it did, people are going to fall back on the racist explanation. Jared believes that the big world impact of his ideas may be in demolishing the basis for racist theories of history and racist views. Why did human history unfold differently on different continents for the last 13,000 years? Jared Diamond, I've set myself the modest task of trying to explain the broad pattern of human history on all the continents for the last 13,000 years. Why did history take such different evolutionary courses for peoples of different continents? This problem has fascinated me for a long time. But it's now, for me, for a long time, because of the recent advances in many fields, seemingly remote from history, including molecular biology, plant and animal genetics and biogeography, archaeology, and linguistics. As we all know, Eurasians, especially peoples of Europe and Eastern Asia, have spread around the globe to dominate the modern world in wealth and power. Other peoples including most Africans, survive and have thrown off European domination but remain behind in wealth and power. Still other peoples, including the original inhabitants of Australia, the Americas, and Southern Africa, are no longer even masters of their own lands but have been decimated, subjugated, or exterminated by European colonialists. Why did history turn out that way, instead of the opposite way? Why were not Native Americans, Africans, and Aboriginal Australians the ones who conquered or exterminated Europeans and Asians? This big question can be easily pushed back one step further. By the year AD 1500, the approximate year when Europe's overseas expansion was just beginning, people of the different continents. Much of Eurasia and North Africa is occupied by the Iron Age of states and empires, some of them on the verge of industrialization. 
Two Native American peoples, the Incas and Aztecs, ruled over empires with stone tools and were just starting to experiment with bronze, parts of sub-Saharan, but all peoples of Australia, New Guinea, and the Pacific Islands, and many peoples of the Americas and sub-Saharan Africa, were still living as farmers or even as hunter gatherers with stone tools. Obviously, those differences as of A.D. 1500 were the immediate cause of the modern world's inequalities. Empires with iron tools conquered or exterminated tribes with stone tools. But how did the world evolve to the way that it was in the year? A.D. 1500, this question, too, can be easily pushed back a further step. With the help of written histories and archaeological discoveries, until the end of the last ice age around 11,000 BC, all humans on all continents were still living as Stone Age hunter-gatherers. Different rates of development on different continents, from 11,000 BC to AD 1500, were what produced the inequalities of AD 1500. While Aboriginal Australians and many Native American peoples remained Stone Age hunter-gatherers, most Eurasian peoples, and many peoples of the Americas and Sub-Saharan Africa, gradually developed agriculture, herding, metallurgy, and complex political organization, parts of Eurasia, and one small area of the Americas. But each of these new developments appeared earlier in Eurasia than elsewhere. So, we can finally rephrase our question about the evolution of the modern world's inequalities as follows. Why did human development proceed at such different rates on different continents for the last 13,000 years? Those differing rates represent the broadest pattern of history. The biggest unsolved problem of history, and my subject today. Historians tend to avoid this subject like the plague because of its apparently racist overtones. Many people, or even most people, assume that the answer involves biological differences in average IQ among the world's populations, despite the fact that there is no evidence for the existence of such IQ differences. Even to ask the question why different peoples had different histories strikes some of us as evil, because it appears to be justifying what happened in history. In fact, we study the injustices of history for the same reason that we study genocide, and for the same reason that psychologists study the minds of murderers and rapists, not in order to justify history genocide, murder, and rape, but instead to understand how those evil things came about and then to use that understanding so as to prevent their happening again. In case the stink of racism still makes you feel uncomfortable about exploring this subject, just reflect on the underlying reason why so many people accept racist explanations of history's broad pattern. We don't have a convincing alternative explanation. Until we do, people will continue to gravitate by default to racist theories. That leaves us with a huge moral gap, which constitutes the strongest reason for tackling this uncomfortable subject. Let's proceed continent by continent. As our first continental comparison, let's consider the collision of the old world and the new world that began with Christopher Columbus's voyage in AD 1492 because the proximate factors involved in that outcome are well understood. I'll now give you a summary and interpretation of the histories of North America, South America, Europe, and Asia from my perspective as a biogeographer and evolutionary biologist divided by all that in 10 minutes, 2 underscore minutes per continent. Here we go. Most of us are familiar with the stories of how a few hundred Spaniards under Cortes and Pizarro overthrew the Aztec and Inca empires. The populations of each of those empires numbered tens of millions. We are also familiar with the gruesome details of how other Europeans conquered other parts of the New World. The result is that Europeans came to settle and dominate most of the New World while the Native American population declined drastically from its level as of AD 1492. Why did it happen that way? 
Why didn't it instead happen that the emperors Montezuma or Atahualpa led the Aztecs or Incas to conquer Europe? The proximate reasons are obvious. Invading Europeans had steel swords, guns, and horses, while Native Americans had only stone and wooden weapons and no animals that could be ridden. Those military advantages repeatedly enabled troops of a few dozen mounted Spaniards to defeat Indian armies numbering in the thousands. Nevertheless, steel swords, guns, and horses weren't the sole proximate factors behind the European conquest of the New World. Infectious diseases introduced with Europeans, like smallpox and measles, spread from one Indian tribe to another, far in advance of Europeans themselves, and killed an estimated 95% of the New World's Indian population. Those diseases were endemic in Europe and Europeans had had time to develop both genetic and immune resistance to them, but Indians initially had no such resistance. That role played by infectious diseases in the European conquest of the New World was duplicated in many other parts of the world, including Aboriginal Australia, Southern Africa, and many Pacific Islands. Finally, there is still another set of proximate factors to consider. How is it that Pizarro and Cortes reached the New World at all? Before Aztec and Inca conquistadors could reach Europe, that outcome depended partly on technology in the form of ocean-going ships. Europeans had such ships, while the Aztecs and Incas did not. Also, those European ships were backed by the centralized political organization that enabled Spain and other European countries to build and staff the ships. Equally crucial was the role of European writing in permitting the quick spread of accurate detailed information, including maps, sailing directions, and accounts by earlier explorers, back to Europe. To motivate later explorers, so far, we've identified a series of proximate factors behind European colonization of the New World, namely, ships, political organization and writing that brought Europeans to the New World, European germs that killed most Indians before they could reach the battlefield, and guns, steel swords, and horses that gave Europeans a big advantage on the battlefield. Now, let's try to push the chain of causation back further. Why did these proximate advantages go to the Old World rather than to the New World? Theoretically, Native Americans might have been the ones to develop steel swords and guns first, to develop ocean-going ships and empires and writing first, to be mounted on domestic animals more terrifying than horses, and to bear germs worse than smallpox. The part of the question that's easiest to answer concerns the reasons why Eurasia evolved the nastiest germs. It's striking that Native Americans evolved no devastating epidemic diseases to give to Europeans, in return for the many devastating epidemic diseases that Indians received from the Old World. There are two straightforward reasons for this gross imbalance. First, most of our familiar epidemic diseases can sustain themselves only in large dense human populations concentrated into villages and cities which arose much earlier in the Old World than in the New World. Second, recent studies of microbes by molecular biologists have shown that most human epidemic diseases evolved from similar epidemic diseases of the dense populations of Old World domestic animals with which we came into close contact. For example, Measles and TB evolved from diseases of our cattle, influenza from a disease of pigs, and smallpox possibly from a disease of camels. The Americas had very few native domesticated animal species from which humans could acquire such diseases. Let's now push the chain of reasoning back one step further. Why were there far more species of domesticated animals in Eurasia than in the Americas? The Americas harbor over a thousand native wild mammal species. So you might initially suppose that the Americas offered plenty of starting material for domestication. 
In fact, only a tiny fraction of wild mammal species has been successfully domesticated, because domestication requires that a wild animal fulfill many prerequisites. The animal has to have a diet that humans can supply, a rapid growth rate, a willingness to breed in captivity, a tractable disposition. A social structure involving submissive behavior towards dominant animals and humans, and lack of a tendency to panic when fenced in. Thousands of years ago, humans domesticated every possible large wild mammal species fulfilling all those criteria and worth domesticating. With the result that there have been no valuable additions of domestic animals in recent times, despite the efforts of modern science. Eurasia ended up with the most domesticated animal species in part because it's the world's largest land mass and offered the most wild species to begin with. That pre-existing difference was magnified 13,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age, when most of the large mammal species of North and South America became extinct, perhaps exterminated by the first arriving Indians. As a result, Native Americans inherited far fewer species of big wild mammals than did Eurasians, leaving them only with the llama and alpaca as a domesticate. Differences between the old and new worlds in domesticated plants, especially in large seeded cereals, are qualitatively similar to THESE differences in domesticated mammals, though the difference is not so extreme.